Chapter 12. After breakfast, me and Mr. Lewis said goodbye to the sleeps and got back into the car. I leaned over the front seat to put my suitcase in the back. Mr. Lewis, someone stole all the blood last night. He said, I'll say one thing for you, bud. When you go to sleep, you go way, way to sleep. You don't remember anything about last night after we got to Flint? I said, I don't think so, sir. After you so rudely fell asleep on me, we dropped the blood off at Hurley Hospital. Then I gassed up. Then I got in touch with your daddy to let him know we were all right. Uh-oh. What'd he say, sir? I didn't call him. I sent a telegram to the log cabin. He still owns that club, doesn't he? Yes, sir. Good. Lefty Lewis leaned over and reached in the glove box of the car. He pulled out a flimsy piece of yellowed paper and handed it to me. Across the top of the paper, it said in big letters, Western Union. Underneath it, that, it said, heck, stop. Bud, okay, in Flint, stop. At 4309 North Street, stop. Return 8 p.m. Wednesday, stop. Lefty, stop. Man, I'll bet Hermione Calloway was just as confused by this message as I was. I said, what does this mean, sir? Lefty Lewis said, when you send a telegram, the more le the letters you use, the more money you have to pay. So you try to keep your message as short as you can. Here, let me see it. I handed him the paper. He said, okay, H-E-C, that stands for your dad, Herman E. Calloway. Bud O.K. in Flint. That lets him know how far you got and that you're safe. And you did get pretty far, Bud, but he won't be too hard on you when he sees how resourceful you were at running away. I know I'd have been darn proud of one of my kids if they'd gotten that far, but I used to offer them money to run and they'd never take it. At 4309 North Street, well, that's my daughter's address, and return 8 p.m. Wednesday lets him know when I'll be bringing you home by 8 tonight. I said, what are all those stops, sir? He said, that's the telegram's office way of saying period. It just means that the sentence is over. Lefty Lewis spent most of the day doing errands all around Flint. He made me promise to wait in the car for him. I was good and happy when he said, that's it, bud. Time to head home. We drove past that sign that said, welcome to Flint on one side when he looked up and said, uh-oh. Suddenly, a siren went off, sounding like it was in the back seat of the car. I raised my head up to look over the seat over the back window. Uh-oh was right. There was a Flint police car right behind us with the red light on top of his roof flashing on and off, on and off, and with the siren blasting. They found me. Shucks, this doggone FBI was just as good as the movie said it was. They were just like those Royal Canadian Mountain Police. They always got their man. I crouched down as low as I could. Lefty Lewis pulled the car over to the side of the road and said real calm and real slow, Bud, it's very important that you listen very carefully to what I say I'm going to tell you and that you do exactly as I say. He kept his eyes stuck on the rearview mirror. By the way he was acting, I was starting to think that maybe Lefty Lewis was on the lam too. And wait a minute, how come this man didn't have a real name? Who ever heard of someone's mama naming him Lefty? That name had alias written all over it. Lefty sounds like a real good name for a stick-up man. It seemed like it would be real easy for Machine Gun Kelly to point at some poor slob and say, that's the guy who ratted me out, Lefty, finish him off. And what he just said about listening carefully and doing exactly what he said was number eight of Bud Caldwell's rules and things to have a funner life and make a better liar out of yourself. Rules and things number eight. Whenever an adult tells you to listen carefully and talks to you in a real calm voice, do not listen. Run as fast as you can because something real terrible is just around the corner, especially if the cops are chasing you. I stared at Lefty Lewis, keeping my fingers crossed that the next thing he said wouldn't be, you'll never take us alive, copper. Instead, he said, bud, are you listening, bud? I had to play along until I got a chance to make a break. I said, Yes, sir. Attaboy. First, close your mouth. Good. Now I want you to take the box that is next to me and quickly put it all the way beneath your seat. I picked up a box that was about the size of a big, thick book and slid it under my seat. Lefty Lewis said, good boy. Now stay put and don't say anything. He winked at me and said, don't worry, it's all right. He opened his door and walked back to the police car. I tried to decide what to do. If I made a break for it, I was sure the coppers would plug me. But maybe Lefty Lewis would wrestle the gun away before they got a good shot off. Or maybe, just maybe, Lefty Lewis would take a bullet for me. Okay, I told myself, 
I'm a count of 10. Then I'm going to reach into the back seat, snatch my suitcase, and book out of those buildings. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, I'm going to count to 10 again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <sighs> okay, this time I'm really, really going to grab that dog on. The cop and Lefty Lewis were standing at the door. The cop said, I want to take a look in the trunk. Him and Mr. Lewis went around to the back and the trunk and opened and I heard someone rumpling around in it. I heard a loud bang and nearly jumped out of my seat. Whew, it was only Mr. Lewis closing the trunk. They walked back to the driver's door. The policeman looked in the back seat and said, what's in the suitcase? Mr. Lewis said, those are Bud's things. He was visiting here in Flint and I'm taking him home to Grand Rapids. The police looked at me and said, oh, your grandson, huh? You two look just alike. Lefty Lewis said, why, thank you, officer. I always thought the boy was unusually handsome. The cop didn't have a good sense of humor. He said, all right, you're free to go. Can't be too careful. I don't know if you heard, but we've been having a lot of trouble in the factories here. We've been stopping all cars we don't recognize. There have been reports that some more of those stinking labor unions might be sneaking up here into Detroit. Mr. Lewis said, you don't say. The cop said, drive carefully. And he touched the brim of his hat the way that a cowboy in the moving pictures does. Lefty Lewis got in the car, started it, and we pulled back out on the highway. He made a scary face at me and said, Bud, this has really been a couple of lucky days for you. First, I saved you from being eaten by some vampires in Owasso. Then you seem to have survived my daughter's pain cake. And finally, that police officer saves you from the feared and loathsome labor organizers of Detroit. You are truly blessed. Lefty Lewis was back to acting normal, but I kept wondering what was in the box he didn't want the cop to see. I said, what's a labor organizer, sir? Mr. Lewis said, in Flint, they are people who are trying to get unions in the automobile factories. Before I had a chance to get my next question in, Lefty Lewis said, I'm going to save your breath for you, bud. I'll bet the next thing out your mouth was going to be, what's a union, right? Yes, sir. A union is like a family. It's when a group of workers get together and try to make things better for themselves and their children. That's all, sir. That's all. And why are the cops after them? That's a very good question. Look in that box you put under your seat. I pulled the box out and put it in my lap and looked over at Lefty Lewis. He looked back at me and checked the rearview mirror. Go ahead. I stopped for a second. Maybe there was a loaded cocked pistol hiding in the box. Maybe Lefty Lewis would have shot it out at the cop if he'd try to take us to jail. I started raising the top off the box and just as I was about to get it open, Lefty Lewis moved a lot faster than you'd think somebody's grandkid could and slapped his hand on top of it, closed it back tight. Uh-oh, maybe this was loot from a bank that had that him and Al Capone had knocked over. Maybe Lefty Lewis would have to rub me out if I saw what was inside. Maybe if I looked, I'd know too much. He said, before you look bad, you gotta understand that what's in there is very dangerous. I said, well, sir, I, I really don't think I need to see it, sir. I think I'll just look out the window until we get to Grand Rapids or maybe, oh, I gave a big fake yawn. Maybe I'll take a nap. He laughed and said, ha, you're a lot smarter than you look, bud. You know, it would have been curtains for us if that copper would have seen what's in there. He tapped the top of the box. All I could say was, yes, sir. He said, go ahead and open it, but you have to promise. No, you have to swear that you won't breathe a word about what you see to anyone. Mr. Lewis, sir, I'd really rather take a nap. Well, first open the box. I took in a big gulp of air and started to raise the top up the box again. Lefty Lewis yelled, but I jumped so high, I nearly banged my head on the roof of the car. I yelled back, yes, sir. I didn't hear you swear to keep your lips locked. Oh, shucks, Mr. Lewis, I swear, but I'd feel a lot better if I could take a doggone nap. I snatched the top off the box and got ready to be scared to death. It was just some paper with writing on it. Maybe the pistol the loot was under all this paper. I kept lifting paper until I got to the bottom of the box. Nothing. I looked at Lefty Lewis. He said, I warned you. Pretty dangerous, isn't it? I must have missed something. I went through the box again. How's some paper dangerous? Read it. I took one of the papers out. It said, Attention railroad workers, the newly formed Grand Rapids branch of the Brotherhood of Pullman Porters will be holding an informational meeting on Wednesday, July 23rd, 1936. 
All interested parties, please come to 2345 Coldbrook at 9 o'clock. Refreshments will be served. You know what we're up against. Please keep this as confidential as possible. It was starting to make sense. I said, Mr. Lewis, are you one of those labor organizers? He laughed. Not really, bud. I'm picking these up so we can pass them out in Grand Rapids. We've been negotiating to get a union for the Pullman Porters for years now, and nowhere in Grand Rapids will print these flyers for us. The only place that would do them is all the way in Flint. You were running away to a pretty hot town, young man. Wow. That trouble the policeman was talking about at the factory is called a sit-down strike. Instead of walking in front of the plant with signs, the people who are on strike just sit down on the job. That way, the bosses can't bring other people in to steal their jobs. They're going to sit there until the company gives them a union, so the company is trying everything they can think of to get them out. That's why I said those flyers are so dangerous. The people who run the factories and the railroads seem to be real scared. To them, if a worker has any dignity or pride, he can't be doing a good job. Boy, these automobiles were great for making you conk out. Between the car floating real soft down the road and Lefty Lewis's boring stories about the railroad and the union and baseball, I was out cold in no time. When I woke up, I looked out the window and stretched. Lefty Lewis said, I was about to take you to Butterworth Hospital. I thought you'd left the earth for good. He pointed out the window and said, looking familiar? Uh-oh. Yes, sir. I pointed at a gasoline filling station and said, yep, that's the gasoline filling station. He said, I guess your daddy would have had to burn premium in that big Packard, wouldn't he? I don't think those big engines can run on ethyl gasoline. I said, no, sir, that's right. He told me, well, you and your daddy sure have one beautiful machine. I was getting real nervous, but I said, thank you, sir. We turned into another corner and my heart started jumping around in my stomach. Halfway down the street was a building that looked like it was made out of giant chopped down trees. The log cabin. Uh-oh. Right outside the place was a sign that said, appearing Friday through Sunday in July, Herman E. Calloway and the Nubian Knights of the New Deal. My father had joined a new band. Lefty Lewis pulled up next to a car that was as long as a big boat. He said, ah, there's the Packard. He's here. I had to think real fast. I couldn't let Mr. Lewis and Herman E. Calloway talk to each other. If they did, I'd be on the first thing smoking back to Flint. And besides, I felt kind of bad about lying to Mr. Lewis. I wished I didn't have to. Lefty Lewis cut the car off and pulled the key out of the dashboard. I said, Mr. Lewis, this is going to be very embarrassing for me. What is, bud? Can I go talk to my father by myself, sir? I swear I'll turn myself into him. Lefty Lewis looked at me kind of hard. Well, bud, I don't mean to sully your reputation, but you just run away from that man all the way across the state. I think I'd better hand deliver you. But Mr. Lewis, sir, I need to explain it to him by myself. I promise I'll go in and, and, and not run away again. Lefty Lewis looked out the back of the windshield like he was thinking. He reached back across the seat and put his hand on the twine keeping my suitcase together. He said, I'll tell you what, bud. You don't go anywhere without this, do you? I said, no, sir. Okay, here's the deal. I'll give you, he looked at his wristwatch, five minutes to talk to your dad alone. If you're not back by then, I'll bring your bag in for you. It wasn't great, but it would have to do. Besides, it gave me some more time to think. Please promise that you won't go look inside for it. Look inside of it, sir. He raised his hand. You got my word. I got out of the car and walked to the front of the log cabin. The doors looked like they were made out of chopped down trees, just like the rest of the building. I looked back at Lefty Lewis, and he was still watching, so I opened one of the doors. I knew it was one of those doors that Mama had been talking about. I walked in to see what was going to happen. Shucks, there was another set of regular doors inside. The front door closed behind me and I was in the dark. I tried the other door and it came open, but I didn't push it all the way in. I waited, then went back out to get my bag. I walked over to the driver's side of Lefty Lewis's car, smiled and said, thank you very much, sir. He's in there. He was so glad to see me that I'm not even a whole, in a whole lot of trouble. He's real busy right now and told me to tell you thank you very much and he'd get a hold of you. Lefty Lewis smiled too. <laughs> well, he might be happy now. But if I know anything about your daddy, I expect he's going to be having problems sitting down before this night's all over. Now, I know he's going to tell you this, but I got to add my two cents. Son, there's just too, there just aren't too many places a young Negro boy should be traveling by himself, especially not clear across Michigan. There are folks in this state that make your average Ku Kluxer look like John Brown. 
You know who John Brown is? Uh-oh, no, sir. That's all right. He's out there moldering somewhere. But the point is, you were very lucky this time. You got to be good and stay put. I know your dad's not the easiest man in the world, but believe me, he's mellowed out a lot from when it was just him and your sister. The next time you're out of a mind to do a little traveling, you come on down to the train station and ask for Lefty Lewis first. I won't tell anyone, but we need to talk about you set out on your own again before you set out on your own again. Lefty Lewis. Think you can remember that name? Lefty Lewis. Well, at least he was using his alias all over and not just with me and his family in Flint. He handed my bag out of the window. Okay, get back out in there and tell your daddy I said hello. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I stood waving until the big car turned out into the street. I sucked in a jumbo gulp of air and opened the front door again. This time, I pushed the second set of doors open and walked in. It was dark, but I could see that there were six men sitting in a circle on a little stage at the other end of the room. One of them was white. Five of the men had their eyes on the other guy. One of them had drumsticks in his hands and was leaned over softly tapping out a rhythm on the wooden stage floor. Three of them were drinking from bottles of pop, and one, a real old one, was using a rag to wipe the inside of a trumpet. The guy who had to be my father was sitting with his back to me wearing a hat. He was talking just like me, and it didn't take too much listening to tell he was lying, or at least some doing some real good exaggerating, just like I do. That was all the proof I needed. His voice was a lot rougher and more tired sounding than I thought it would be. He leaned back in his chair. That's right. After I won the Golden Gloves, no one couldn't tell me I was going to be middleweight champ within two, three years tops. The drummer stopped tapping. Middleweight? What? That was so long ago, gravity wasn't as strong as it is now, or did a pound just weigh less back then? <laughs> the others laughed, but my dad didn't let it bother him. That's right. Middleweight. Gotta keep in mind that I had more hair and fewer pounds back then. He pulled the hat off and rubbed his hands over his glass smooth head. My dad shaved his head. That was something I always wanted to do, too. He said, my manager goes and lines up about against a fighter out of Chicago by the name of Jordan Snaggletooth McNevin. From the name, I'm expecting some young Irish kid with bad teeth. But this guy was one of us and so old that he could have been awaiting for us at the last supper. When you fight began, I wasn't about to show mercy, you understand? All the guys on stage were nodding. And to make a long story longer, I go out and flick this halfway stiff right jab clean at Pop's head and the horn guy said, Herman, to this day, I can't believe you swung at that old man. What was I supposed to do, Jimmy? I wasn't trying to kill him or nothing. I just wanted to put him down quiet and quick. Jimmy went, uh, uh, uh. And the next thing I know, I'm watching my mouthpiece and my chance to be champ flying out of the ring into the fourth row of seats. I ain't never been hit so hard in my life, the drummer said. You lost one fight and quit. Then Hermony e. Calloway said the words that let me know I was right. I felt like someone had cut a light on inside me. I knew it had been right for me to come all the way from Flint to Grand Rapids to find my dad. The idea that had started as a teeny weeny seed in a suitcase was now a mighty maple. Hermony e. Calloway, my father, said, there comes a time when you're doing something and you realize it just doesn't make any sense to keep on doing it. And Jay, you ain't being a quitter. It's just that you, the good Lord has seen fit to give you the sense to know, you understand, enough is enough. That was the exact same thought I'd had when I got whipped by Toddy Boy. Only two folks with the same blood would think them just alike. I sucked in a big gulp of air, got a good grip on my suitcase, and walked into the light of the stage. The old horn guy, Jimmy, saw me first and said, I thought I heard the door open. Did Miss Thomas send you, son? I just kept walking onto the stage. I had to see my father's face. I knew we'd looked so much alike that the truth would hit him as hard as that snaggletooth guy had. Even Lefty Lewis said he could tell me and Herman E. Calloway were kin. He turned to see who Jimmy was talking to and my mighty maple started shaking in the wind. My dad's face was old. My dad's face was real old, just like this horn guy. Maybe, maybe too old but there was just too much proof that this was my father. He smiled at me. He had his arms crossed over a great big stomach with his head wiping rag hanging out of his right hand. The first thing my dad said to me was, well, 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 little man, what brings you here? Miss Thomas? I don't know any Miss Thomas, sir. So what are you doing here? 
He put his hand over his eyes to shield them from the stage lights and looked out into the dark part of the bar. I noticed how wrinkly my dad's hand was. Who brought you here? Your folks out there? No, sir. I'm here to meet my father. Jimmy said, who's your daddy? Why did he tell you to meet him here? I kept looking at Hermony e. Calloway. He didn't tell me to meet him here, sir. I came all the way from Flint to meet my daddy for the very first time. All the men looked over at the drummer. He stopped tapping. He said, oh, man, look, this child ain't no kid of mine. What is your mama's name, boy? I said, you ain't my daddy. I pointed right at Hermione Calloway's big belly. You know it's you. All the eyes jumped over on Herman E. Calloway. He quit smiling and looked at me a lot harder, like he was really noticing me. I knew if I was a regular kid, I'd be crying buckets of tears now. I didn't want these men to think I was a baby, so I was real glad that my eyes don't cry no more. My nose plugged up and a little growl came out my mouth, but I kept my finger pointed, cleared my throat and said, I know it's you. 